Yeah, I'm Jen. <laughs> and I'm a mathematician. <laughs> yeah, I know how you're feeling. Oh, a few of you are thinking to yourself, oh, yeah, math is real comforting. I like that there's always like a procedure and there's a right answer to compute. But lots of you, and you know who you are, are thinking about how much you hate math, aren't you? Yeah, that's what I thought. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, I remember when I was in third grade and I was one of those last kids to memorize my sevens, right? Or maybe it was middle school and you were embarrassed by some kind of like a public time test. Or maybe it was that fire hose of formulas that was algebra. Or two column proofs in geometry. For lots of us, math was brutal and boring, right? Brutal and boring. And I'm here to tell you that mathematics is not what you think it is. So bear with me, those of you who are comforted and those of you who were traumatized, because math is not about memorizing formulas and procedures. And it's not about being fast. In fact, most mathematicians I know are slow, like painfully slow, careful thinkers. And get this. It's not even fundamentally about numbers. Math is about patterns. It's about making sense of patterns so that you can predict everything there is to know about them. And I want to assure you that the narrow band of ability and skills assessed by most math tests do not measure real mathematical ability. So whether you think you like it, or not, <laughs> whether you think you're good at it or not, you just might be wrong about that. I'm going to try to convince you, okay? So bear with me, all right? We're going to do something. Look up here. <laughs> so you see a little pattern there? I'm going to call those frame figures. And what you're seeing before you, I'm going to name them like based on how many X's there are in their top row. So you're seeing frame figures two through five, all right? And I want you to just think for a minute about how many X's there would be in frame figure 10. Really do it, and no, don't draw it. How many X's in frame figure 10? Hmm. Don't blurt it out. Think it in your mind. Okay, so there might be lots of things that you're doing out there right now, and it's okay if you don't know yet what your answer is, right? But perhaps you started thinking to yourself, I see a numeric pattern here. You know that first figure, the one with two across the top, so figure two has four, and then the next one has eight, and then 12, and then 16, and you thought to yourself, those are changing by four each time. So I could keep counting up, and I could figure out how many would be in the one with 10 across the top. Or maybe you notice that all those numbers, 4, 8, 12, 16, are all multiples of 4 in the first place. And maybe you thought to yourself, see that frame figure 5 does not quite have four fives. It has four fours. 16 is 4 times 4. So maybe frame figure 10 would have four nines, and that would be 36. Or maybe, <laughs> yes, maybe you thought about how these figures were growing geometrically. Maybe you thought about it like that, or like this, to get from one figure to the next. And do you notice that the structure of these patterns makes it make sense that you would see four more X's in each consecutive pattern? Or maybe you even thought from the start just about how these frames were composed. So perhaps you saw it like I, con I um, conveyed the one just a minute ago with four nines, right? As you see around the pinwheel here, four, 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 white, red, white, red around the outside. 
So four sets of one minus the frame figure. Notice that gets us a general formula for how many x's are in, the, say, any frame figure. Or this was my instinct. What's to think about it like this, right? Each row and column would have 10 in frame figure 10, but then I double counted the corners. I'll take them back, right? Notice that gets us another formula. Or maybe you were a little fancy, right? And you thought, yeah, I'm going to think about it as a filled-in grid. That'd be n times n, n rows of n x's. But then I'm going to take back the middle. And that gets me the number as well. Yeah, some of you did that. I see. Mm -hmm. So we just did a little bit of math. We looked at a pattern, and we analyzed it based on its structure. And out of that, we created not one, not two, but actually three formulas for dealing with case n. Any figure at all. We own that figure. We completely understand it. Do you see that? That's what math is about. It might be worth thinking about how this would have gone down in, um, in high school or in middle school, right? At least back when I was in school, probably the teacher would have shown us a frame. And then she would have perhaps shown us how to compute the number of x's. She probably would have explained the formula, and it probably would have been the most efficient one. Nothing fancy. And then we would have found that in that little blue box in our book. And then we would have had to remember it. And then on problems like 1 through 37, the odd, we would have to do that. <laughs> yes? And then we get assessed, like, can you find the number of x's in this frame on the test? Whatever, right? That was, that's very traditional mathematics. But here's the thing. Memorizing that formula is basically useless. It's not like you come across that situation very often where that's exactly what you need, is to count, like, the number of x's in a frame, right? It's useless. In fact, most formulas are useless. When my students say to me, well, when do I need to know this? I often say, you probably won't, right? But do you know what is useful? The thinking that led to the formula. That's real math, and real math is real useful. Mm hmm <laughs> Yeah. Um, by the way, I do not blame my teacher or yours for the misrepresentation of school math in our educational system. Teachers work under these enormous constraints, right? And the biggest ones around this are our expectations about mathematics. I'm going to give you the big four, and these all but guarantee that real math is not anywhere in the school curriculum. Okay, so first of all, most people don't know what math is about. They think it is the formulas. So they think you got to memorize them and you got to use them. And that misunderstanding, right, comes for a lot of it right there. The second thing is that we have a really hard time with anything new in education. So when a new program that maybe involves more problem solving or critical thinking is introduced, there's a lot of pushback to that. Number three. We expect our children and our nation to do well on standardized tests. And standardized tests tend to assess fast execution of memorized formulas. That's easy to grade, and it's easy to test. Right? And they're all timed. And last of all, and this is actually new, we now expect our good math students to take calculus in high school. Okay? In the 50s, calculus for math majors and physics majors and engineers was a college sophomore course. It was very controversial when it moved down to be a freshman course. People said, are students mature enough to do calculus as freshmen in college? And it did become a freshman course, and it was until the 90s. And somewhere in the late 90s, so only in the last two decades, has it been creeping into the high school. And it's become like this weird badge of honor to take calculus while you're in high school. Right? And here's what's wrong with that. First of all, they were right to question whether students were ready to take calculus in high school. A little bit of mathematical maturity 
would be really helpful for calculus. But second of all, it turns the mathematics curriculum into a race for all of us. And it narrows down sort of what is offered mathematically. We have to offer all the classes and all the stuff that gets everybody ready to take calculus, whether they do or not. Right? So this turns math into a race, and it also turns it into a filter. And it filters out people who are slow, careful, creative problem solvers. And it's the wrong filter. It's not even the right filter. And it's particularly brutal at filtering out girls and students of color. So we need to uh, push back against some of these expectations. So I suggest a few things, right? Help us lift the weight, if you will. One of those things that I suggest is when your student or your child says to you, the teacher's just making us do all this activities and we have to try to figure this out. I can't figure that out for myself. Why don't they just give me the formula? You should say, because what you're trying to do in class is real math. Real math, you're not doing any math if someone just gives you the formula. It's not what math is about. Second of all, if your school tries to adopt a new program where it's going in a direction of creative and persistent problem solving, right? See if there are things in there that you can embrace and support. Third, let's just try really hard to resist the pervasive culture of testing. I know that's difficult in our world, but just look for ways you can do that, right? And finally, for goodness sake, do not push your high school students to take calculus in high school. It's not just about them, it's about the whole curriculum in high school. It's a better course in college, in the context and culture of college. And think about the courses we could have in high school if it wasn't all about getting to calculus. We might have mathematical modeling classes, we might have statistical reasoning classes, we might have problem-solving classes, right? I mean, these are things that will give our, our public critical thinking skills, right? And will make our students into real mathematicians. So I ask you to help me to advocate for the real thing, right? Let's advocate for some real math. Thank you.